Titus chapter number 3. Now, the book of Titus, for those of you that are students of your Bible, you know that Titus was a preacher that the Apostle Paul took under his wing to train up, to educate him, to encourage him. For a while, he labored with the Apostle Paul, and then he was entrusted with his own ministry. Well, Titus is a letter that the Apostle Paul has written to a literal man named Titus while the Apostle Paul was in captivity. He writes the letter to him to remind him of some things, to exhort some things to him, to encourage him. And by the time we get to chapter number 3, verse number 1, the Apostle Paul has, in the chapter previous to this, I mean, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, okay? It says that we should speak those things which become sound doctrine, meaning... The things that we say that come out of our mouth shouldn't be contrary to the doctrine of the Bible. But he's just dealt with that. He's dealt with, you know, let the old men be grave. Let them be sound in doctrine, right? Let them be mentors to the younger generation. The women, likewise, training up the younger women, the girls, so that they'd be able to run a household to be a mother, right? How to nurture and raise children in the admonition of the Lord. But then chapter number 3, still continuing the thought of things that are profitable to teach and to preach and to study, he says in verse number 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto men, unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, these things that the Apostle Paul says, that he, he doesn't say, educate them the first time. He doesn't say, hey, you might want to bring this to everybody's attention. No. Look at verse number one. Put them in mind to be subject. In other words, put them in mind means to bring it to the forefront of their mind. This is something that they know. This is something that they've been taught. Okay, elsewhere, the Apostle Paul used the terminology to, that he would put others in remembrance of something. Meaning, it's already been heard. It's just not in the forefront of their mind. It's not something that they've applied, so to speak. Okay, the Bible talks about that there's a difference between hearing and then receiving. Right? When you receive something, it gets past your eardrums and it makes its way down into your heart. If you want to know what's in somebody's heart, the Bible says it's very clear to figure out what that is because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever's in your heart works its way out your mouth. Well, the Apostle Paul's had enough experience with people by this point that he's learned it doesn't matter how much you can get up and say this is the right thing. There's a difference between telling somebody the truth and then encouraging other people to live by the truth. He says, put them in mind. In other words, give them a reason to do the right thing. Okay, people will do the right thing, the supposed right thing, so long as it's not inconvenient to do the wrong thing. You know why most of the time people follow the speed limit? Because they're afraid of speeding tickets. Okay? Some people follow the speed limit because they've gotten so many speeding tickets that if they get another one, they're not going to have a license. Okay? They're not doing the right thing because it's the right thing. They're doing the right thing because of the fear of the consequences of doing the other thing. Okay? All things being equal, people are going to do the easy thing. 
unless you give them a reason to do the difficult thing. Okay? God is not a God that gives us instructions without showing us the other side. Right? The first promise that was, or the first commandment that was given with promise was children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. What was the promise part of that? Well, you do that and your days will be long upon the earth. Right? It's right to do it, but there's also a benefit to doing it. Right? Christ taught that the benefits of following his commandments were a part in the kingdom of heaven. That you would be included in what his father had already purposed to do. The father purposed that the finished work of your salvation was that you would be conformed to the image of Christ completely. That's a good thing. That's something to desire after. That's something to strive for. Right? God doesn't put a carrot on his stick and dangle it out in front of us to get us to do it. God just tells us, this is what I expect, and here's what the finished product's going to be. He doesn't give you all the pieces in between. That's where faith comes in. But he does promise that if you follow his commandments, that it's worth it. Well, here the Apostle Paul's just saying, put it in their mind. Right? Does not the Bible teach that the church, the called out local body of assembled believers are supposed to be of one mind and in one accord that's doctrine if you don't believe me come back next week we may do it if God says do it we'll do it I'll show you every place in the Bible where it says that I had a preacher one time tell me that God likes Hondas because he said that everybody in the church should be in an accord I'm like I think he added a word there he said be in one accord and we're not clowns we're not all fitting in one car okay but we are to be like-minded, right? But what mind are we supposed to have? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ individually and collectively. Well, part of that mind is what the Apostle Paul is teaching here. He says if they want to be one in spirit and walk in communication with the Lord, they're going to have to adhere to these things. Christ did these things, okay? Okay? To be subject to all principalities. Show me once where Christ spoke out against Caesar, spoke out against the Pharisees that they should be overthrown. In fact, at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, right? if you don't believe me, it's not completely historically accurate, but it's a whole lot more accurate in modern day Hollywood movies. Go watch the movie Ben-Hur. Right? There was a movement around the time of Jesus' life where the Jews were considering rebelling against and trying to overthrow Roman occupation and Roman rule. You say, well, that didn't happen, Brother Jordan. Oh, it did. It happened in 70 A.D. That was roughly 30 years after Jesus had gone off the scene, almost 40. Right? There were those of the day that were asking, is it, you know, when they came and they said, you know, should we render unto Caesar what Caesar's? He said, yes, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Render unto God what's God's. He says, tithe and tax are not mutually exclusive. You pay them both. Because God's the one that allowed the rulers to be in place that are taxing you. Right? To be subject to all principalities. Christ didn't rebel against the system. He didn't start a revolution or a movement to destroy others. No, he came seeking to save. He didn't come seeking to destroy. He came to start to found and to build the church. That was the purpose of his earthly ministry. Then he paid the price for the church. He died for it. But it says, be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. You know who magistrates are in our day and age? That'd be the police. That'd be sheriffs. That'd be the chief. Okay? Could be the trooper on the highway. Okay, those were the people that were in charge of enforcing the law. Except back then, they would also be responsible for collecting whatever payment it was, whether it was in a jailhouse or whether it was a fine. Okay, nowadays we've got courthouses that do that. They didn't necessarily have judges back in the day, back in this day and age, in a modern-day court system. If you broke the law, whoever was in charge of your territory, like when... Jesus was put on trial before Pilate. 
Okay? He would render judgment and then somebody else would go and get the payment for it. Right? They would enact the judgment. Those were the magistrates. It says to be, re or to be ready to every good work. It doesn't say to be ready to do every good work. To be ready to every good work. Okay, that word ready in that context. Okay, back in the day, we all know the American Revolution. They were called Minutemen because they were supposed to be able to get to the field or out the door ready to battle in a minute. Right? They were ready men. Okay, there were men that were trained to be quick to be able to respond in a short time period. Okay, nowadays, firefighters, they don't call them from their house when they have a fire. They're down at the fire station. They have a thing called a ready room. You know, it, it has everything that they need in order to gear up. You know what the Apostle Paul is telling Titus to put in the mind of church people? To be ready to every good work. That means when a good work's about ready to happen, you don't have to go back and have a council and check your schedule. You're already ready. You've got a ready room. Yeah, just give me a minute. Not, well, I think I could clear some time in my schedule. I mean, should, do we need to go to the book of James where what we ought to say is that if the Lord willeth, tomorrow we'll go into such and such a city and buy and sell and get gain? He says, to every good work today, because that's all you've got. We ought to be able to get ready quickly. Stay ready, is how most people would say it. You may not have the tool that you need, but you know exactly where it's at to go and get it. Okay, you may not be dressed for the occasion, but you can remedy that real quick. You've got a spiritual ready room that you can go and get prepared for whatever is in front of you. Now see, every good work is not, like God's not telling you to be like the Amish where you've got to raise a whole barn in one day. Okay, that's not what he's talking about in a good work. He says, every good work. You know what's a good work? Witnessing. You know how often in your daily life you get a warning ahead of time that somebody's going to ask you something about the Bible? Very little. Amen. Right? You've got to be ready to every good work. If you weren't ready to witness before the conversation, you're not going to be able to get ready to witness in the middle of the conversation. Stay ready. Right? Stay ready to defend your doctrines. Stay ready to identify what is not right. It's a good work to point out what's wrong. Now keep in mind it said that we're supposed to be subject to powers and principalities and the magistrates, that we're supposed to obey them. It doesn't say go throw a revolution, but it does say to point out when something's not right. It's right for parents to know and to study these Syllabuses that children are bringing home from school and to say, uh-uh, that ain't right. And to take it up with the school board. Am I saying burn the school board down? No. But I'm saying it's right to stand up for what's right. That's a good work. But people are so often intimidated or they delay and they put off and by the time they get around to it, it's too late. You have to stay ready under every good work. Right. Ready is not a finished position. Right? It's not like, for instance, if you was going out to a nice dinner, right? before you leave, at a certain point, you have to go get ready for dinner. You think that ready is, I've got everything on and polished up and ready to go. That's a carnal mentality. The spiritual mentality is that ready is, regardless of what's getting ready to come in front of me, I can handle it. Well, you don't know what it's going to be. It's irrelevant. Do you or do you not believe that an all-knowing God has prepared you beforehand to face what's coming in your life today? Do you or do you not believe that the grace of God is sufficient for whatever you face? Right? Too often, we don't stay ready. Why? Because of what unpreparedness does to the flesh. 
The flesh doesn't like being caught off guard. The flesh doesn't like answering a question that they didn't see coming. The flesh doesn't like submitting to the Holy Ghost. The flesh likes to have the reins of your life. The flesh likes to know exactly how long it's going to take to get to the restaurant. And if there's traffic, how much time it's going to add. And you need to leave at specifically this time if you want any hope of getting there on time. Only to find out when you get there that even though you had a reservation, you're still going to have to wait 45 minutes. Right? Too often we think that ready means in control of the situation. That's not what ready means. Ready means that you're able to face it. If you ever played baseball, you didn't just take batting practice of all fastballs. Those are the easy ones to hit. You had to be prepared to face curveballs and sliders and screwballs and my least favorite, a knuckleball, right? Or worse than that, a slurve. I hated a slurve. I had a 50-50 shot of hitting a knuckleball just depending on which way it dipped or dived on the way to the plate. But what are you saying, brother? You've got to be prepared to face anything. Right? That is the directive of a Christian. He's not saying be ready unto every wicked work or to every questionable work. We're talking about good things. Things that you know were right. That you know that there's a benefit to going out and doing it. But why don't people do it? Because they haven't stayed ready. They're not prepared beforehand to face what the Lord intended them to face that day. But then he says in verse number 2, To speak evil of no man. Uh-oh. I don't know about you, but no man means nobody. Not a person. Right? I don't know how many people in the church even have Twitter. But if we went and we checked Twitter, what are you all saying about politicians? Didn't say criticism. Okay, Didn't say all right, a polite political discourse it says speak evil of no man evil has no place in the mouth of a child of God ever Christ didn't even speak evil of those that were begging for his death as he was hanging on the cross he said father forgive them for they know not what they do he didn't want them condemned for hell for what they did because he knew it was necessary if it comes into your life and you're in the perfect will of God, it's necessary. That's why God allowed it to get to you. Speak evil of no man. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood may be the tool that the enemy uses or may be the enemy because they're aligned with sin, but they aren't my enemy. They're the enemy of God. That's my neighbor. That's my kinsman, if you will, according to the Bible. We're a part of the same nation. We're a part of the same state. We're a part of the same community. Right? Those are people that God wants me to win. How are you going to win somebody after you just spoke evil about them? How are you going to win somebody that just heard you speak evil about somebody else? Speak evil of no man. In fact, the Bible commends us and encourages us and commands us that we should pray for our enemies, not speak evil of them. The most that should be said out of a Christian's mouth about their enemy ought to be begging God to do something in their life. It's not that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. No. It's if you don't have anything nice to say, get it made right on an altar so that you can start praying for that person earnestly. If you have a desire to say something evil of another, there's something wrong with you. Because a Christian ought to pray for their enemies. It says to be no brawlers. I don't know anybody that just goes out and you know, has street, street fights. Because that's socially unacceptable nowadays. There was a time that you could say, let's settle this right now with some bare-knuckle boxing. That was socially acceptable. That's not the case anymore. But you ever know somebody that's just itching to start an argument? 
The fight may not play out with fist, but they've still got the heart of a brawler. They carry a chip around on their shoulder all day long. Instead of trying to justify what it is that they said, what they did, or what they believe, instead, they want to resort to, well, how about the strongest one's the right one? Okay, you lose. God wins. Doesn't matter whether I get a black eye or not, you lose. Right? The heart of a Christian ought to never seek conflict, to initiate it. Fact, go study the armor of God. It's all defensive, except for one thing. That's this. Amen. The sword is not a weapon that we wield. It's a weapon that we are to hide in our hearts so that we might not sin against Him. But it's a weapon wielded by the Holy Ghost. All we can do is tell him the truth. It's up to God on how he uses it. Everything else is meant to protect you from the fight. Well, how does an army win without any weapons, Brother Jordan? That's easy. God does the fighting. Amen. Is it any wonder that when Israel was right with God and they carried the ark of the Lord before them, long before they ever got to the battlefield, God already had something in the works? So much so that they started believing that the ark had power instead of the God who gave them the ark had the power. Other nations thought that if they could capture the ark that they'd be undefeated in battle. They thought it was some great secret weapon. No, that was just a sign, a reminder of the commitment and the promises, the covenant that God made with God's people. You know what this book tells me? This is a covenant. That if you believe on God, what He'll do for you. Regardless of where you pick up the book, the story is still the same. If you put your faith in God, you're not going to be disappointed. It's a covenant that if you believe on His Son, that not only will He save you, He'll secure you, and then one day He'll take you on home. But we ought not be brawlers. Christ wasn't a brawler. In fact, you know what Christ was a master of? A word fitly spoken. There'd be a crowd that wanted to kill somebody because they were caught in the act of adultery. And Christ didn't even say anything. He got down and started writing, it says, on the floor. You know where they were? They were in the temple. I've heard people say that he got down and he started writing in the dirt. What temple ever had dirt floors? The temple, if constructed according to biblical standards, had stone flooring. It said he got down and started writing in the floor. Now you say, you can't write in rock. He did it on the top of the mountain when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. In fact, he wrote on one side and you flipped it over, even though you could see through it, you flipped it over and it had something different written on the backside. What are you saying? He may have done something miraculous or he may have just been drawn on he may not have written anything that they could have seen but he stood up and he said you that are without sin you can cast the first stone and then it says it started with the old men and then eventually got all the way down to the young men they said we cannot stone somebody in righteous indignation while we still have sin in our heart that was part of the law you had to be clean in order to carry out God's judgment did Christ ever raise a fist? Nope. Peter did a couple of times and he got rebuked. Cut a guy's ear off and Jesus said, Peter, bad. Go sit in the corner. And then he picked the guy's ear up and then stuck it back on the side of his head. Christ didn't come to bring conflict. Christ came to bring unification. Not between this group and that group. Unification between God and man to heal the divide that sin caused. You know what the Bible says that all wars and all contests and conflicts, where all those things come from? They come from sin. Somebody that's got a heart that's always looking for conflict is somebody that's harboring some sin in their life. 
because that sin has caused discord inside of them and it's through their actions wants to cause discord with other people they are not at peace within their soul and it shows because they're always trying to stir something up around them but instead it says but gentle showing all meekness unto all men meek doesn't mean that you make yourself a walking mat or a welcome mat for people to walk all over meek means that you don't try to be abrasive to anybody okay now there's some things I've got a long list of people don't know what it is about them okay they just rub me the wrong way right it's not any particular thing they do it's everything they do it's just them and I don't know what it is and brother Randy I'm praying real hard that I learn the lesson so that I don't have to deal with that thorn anymore but it keeps coming around okay what's that mean I haven't either learned the lesson yet or God just wants me to rely on grace one or the other but it doesn't matter what they say it's just it's like nails on a chalkboard right doesn't matter how they come in and how nice they are you feel slimy after you shake their hand right but it says that I'm to show all meekness unto all men. You know what that means? That emotion of my flesh, I know it's not an emotion of my spirit, it's an emotion of the flesh, that ought never reach my face. Doesn't say to lie to them. I may not say, hey, it's good to see you, but I may ask them how they're doing. Right? It doesn't say to you know be a double talker where as soon as they leave I turn around and I start backbiting them that's not meek is it any wonder that God and that Christ in his earthly ministry referred to the followers of God as sheep right? not rams sheep what has a sheep ever done to any of you right sheep has no weapon so to speak a sheep is so dumb it'll walk off a cliff unless you stop it a sheep is not a threat to anybody now if you make a sheep angry you may get head butted but that was your fault not the sheep's fault right the shepherd is supposed to be in charge of protecting the sheep not the sheep we're supposed to be armored we're supposed to be wary of wolves and sheep's clothing but nowhere in there does it say that you're the one that's supposed to go and fight them we're supposed to resist them having done all to stand stand there for doesn't say that you're supposed to go out on a holy crusade and you're supposed to try and eradicate all of this God will take care of it he's just looking for people to stand up for what's right you say well brother Jordan how's it going to happen it'll happen however God wants it to happen or it's not going to happen at all it'll happen by you being submissive to him if God tells you to stand up and to proclaim something that you know is going to be controversial you ought to pray and get your heart into a spot where you preach it out of love instead of out of hate because you're supposed to be meek a lot of people got offended at what Christ said but Christ never said it meaning to offend them he said it in all meekness trying to help them the difference between being meek and being irritating is where your heart's at the difference between rubbing somebody the wrong way and giving bad news in the best way possible Right, is where your heart is at whether you're doing it from a place of love or care or trying to help the person or whether you're saying it just because you know it's going to make the other person angry verse number 3 it says for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish anybody ever been foolish Amen. anybody ever been foolish after you got saved Amen. again 
Who here is without sin and can cast the first stone? We're all guilty of it. To stand up and to ridicule somebody and say, I don't know how they could do it when you've done it, that makes you a Pharisee. You know what Jesus called the Pharisees? A generation of vipers. You know what they brought? They brought venom. They brought something that could only destroy. They didn't bring something that could help. All of their teaching and all of their philosophy, all it did was tear people down to make themselves look better. He says, we ourselves were sometimes disobedient. Anybody ever disobeyed God? Then it says, deceived. Anybody ever been told a lie and you believed it? You ever been in that situation and know how it feels for somebody to come along and try to open your eyes to it? How hard it is to reject what you put your faith in in order to embrace what the truth is? Amen. Too many people have forgotten what it was to be in darkness, to be blinded by sin. And how difficult a struggle it was to be under conviction with God trying to convince you that the truth was the truth. We look down at people that have been deceived. That's not right. Deceived means they don't know any better. Somebody sold them a false bill of goods and they believed it. The devil's crafty and he's convincing. How convincing was he? He had you before you even took your first breath. You were conceived in sin. You bought into it from birth. But then it says, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. Anybody ever chased after what the flesh wanted instead of what the spirit wanted? Why'd you do it? Because you enjoyed it. You know how hard it is to talk a kid off of a roller coaster when they're having the time of their life? But right? inevitably, everybody has that one experience. Hey, I'm already here. Just let me go again. No, it's those people's turn. They can wait. I'm here now. Let's go. Right? We chase the thrill. We chase the experience. Why? Because it's enjoyable for a season. Then it says, living in malice and envy. Anybody ever been filled with bitterness and anger at somebody else? Anybody ever had envy take root in your heart? That's all that the world is. Amen. They're all in a contest to see who can get the biggest, the best, or the shiniest. They're all chasing after something, thinking that that's going to be the cure to all their malice and envy. I got news for you. There's always somebody somewhere that's got something that's newer, cooler, or quicker than whatever it is you've got right now. That's how you keep demand in the marketplace. You bring out something that nobody's ever seen before. That's just marketing strategy. But then, it says, hateful. Now, there are some things that the Bible teaches us we ought to hate. But we are not to be full of hate. Amen. Hateful. Amen. You know what we're supposed to be full of? Love. Yeah. Compassion. Forgiveness. Yes. We're supposed to be full of grace and truth. We're to show grace to others because for Christ's sake, God has showed us grace. Amen. We're supposed to be full of truth because that's the only thing that can help them. Ought not be filled with hate. But then it says, and hating one another. It's one thing to hate somebody. It's another thing to hate the people that you're closest to. That's somebody that's so given over to hate, they can't tell the difference between friend and foe anymore. The final product of hate is that you make yourself the enemy of everyone. And when everyone is your enemy, the devil finally has you where he wants you, isolated, alone. Look at the world. You know why everybody's dividing up into all these different groups and all these different... It's because of hate. If you remove hate from the equation, none of them have anything in common. But they all hate one thing. And watch, as that group gets bigger, you know what happens? 
they're all on the same side and they can't prove that they're better than anybody else because they all hate the same thing so then they start hating things about each other and then it breaks apart into 40 different groups that all have different names now you know why that always happens because they're always looking for something different to hate to show that they're better than the people that do that other thing hate is just a byproduct of pride you see something different in somebody else and for whatever reason maybe because of malice or envy or simply because of hate you find something that you don't like and then you choose to hate that person so you're justified in how you feel about that person being different all that comes from pride but then it says in verse number 4 but we used to be like that but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared verse number 5 not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost the Apostle Paul says but a change happened it wasn't a change that you did it wasn't a change that Caesar did it wasn't a change that the magistrate did it was a change that a thrice holy God from heaven made manifest in your life Amen. right verse number 4 he says after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared until Christ came it was promised when Christ arrived it appeared the love and grace of God was made manifest in flesh and gave himself over to death on a cross so that it would be evident right that it was not only appeared but it appeared and could not be refuted could not be dismissed well how was that work done well it wasn't done by works of righteousness which we have done Christ didn't show up one day because somebody finally checked all the boxes on the righteousness card. Christ didn't show up because people spent enough time in a prayer closet. Christ showed up because it was the time that God ordained him to show up. He showed up solely through the mercy and grace of God, showing unedited, infallible love towards mankind. Then he says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, that's two different things. Right? I've heard that regeneration and renewing mean the same thing. No, they don't. They might mean something similar, but they're not the same. You know what to regenerate means? It means to restore to put back as it's meant to be. When you get a cut, you know why it scabs over? So that your body can regenerate the tissue that was lost. And see, our bodies are imperfect things because they're cursed by sin. That's why we have scars afterwards. True regeneration, which God did, according to verse number 5, right? He washed us in what? The blood of Christ. You know what that did? It cleaned out the infection. What was the infection? Sin. But it also regenerated. All those things that sin had killed off in your life, things that you knew nothing about, like the fruit of the Spirit, okay, those things like mercy and compassion, a love for the things of God, you know what He did? He regenerated them. You cannot regenerate what was not put there originally. You know what God made Adam and then later Eve with? A love of God in their hearts. They still were free moral agents. They had to choose whether they loved that or they loved disobedience more. But until they chose to disobey God, they chose to embrace that love. They were partakers in the things of God. They had the fruit of the Spirit in their life because they were alive. Well, when God saved you, He regenerated those things and made them the way that they were before sin came in. He gave you the ability to not only act in a spiritual manner, right, to grow your spirituality, to use it in the first place, but that it could become stronger. He put it back the way that it should have been all along. 
so that you could continue to grow in Christ. But then it says, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. To regenerate means to put it back as if nothing was ever wrong. Renewing means to revitalize. Renewing means to revive. That word revival, you know what you're begging God to do? You're just begging God to renew some things in your heart. And notice who the actor, the person doing the renewing is. That's the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. You know who would be the deliverer, if you will, of revival? The Holy Ghost. Why? Because all it is is a renewing. By washing you in the blood, right? Once it's under the blood, then the Spirit can do what? Renew your spirit. You know what that means? To remove impurities that have come into its sense. You're sealed until the day of promise. Nothing can taint your, your salvation. Nothing can destroy your spirituality from the devil's point of view. Your spirituality can fade. It can die off because you don't use it. But it's not because of anything that the devil did to it. It's because you chose to let it happen. This world can't touch your spirituality. But every now and then, you step in a mud puddle. You know what happens? That glass that the Apostle Paul said, you know, we see through a glass dimly, yeah. right? That meant that it was a mirror that had become dirty, and the image had gotten a little wonky. We couldn't see all the details. You know what this renewing is? He takes your spirituality, which is sealed, and he cleans off the container, the flesh. He gets the impurities off of what is pure so that you can see all the details in it from the outside. You know what a carnal Christian, what the definition of that is? They've let things get in the way where people can't see their spirituality any longer. Something has obscured the view from the world's viewpoint of what God put in you. You know what renewing is? It's getting all that stuff out of the way. You're still as saved as you were the day you got saved. But there are things that have been encircling, ensnaring your spirituality that need to be taken away. He renews it. He cleans it up. Why? So that you can shine for Jesus. But then, verse number 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He says, God did all of that. What we just read in the past couple of verses. Took you from what you used to be, turned you into a child of God, so that, being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There are some heirs here down on earth that they're just hoping that somebody kills off so they get the inheritance there are some heirs that want nothing to do with their family but there are some heirs that have a hope a hope of continuing a family legacy a hope of improving upon what those did before them we were always intended to be heirs according to the hope of eternal life you know what ought to be in the forefront of your mind every day? That one day, eternity is going to start. It says the hope of eternity. That means you're looking forward to it. But it doesn't say that we're supposed to be made heirs according to the dread of eternal life. Oh no, I've got to do everything that I can do because one day I'm going to have to give an account. No, we're ought to do it with joy. Because we have the hope of eternal life. When, we, when you have a hope in something that other people don't, guess what? You want to tell them about it. When your hope is what you will be in Christ one day, you want to make sure that you're renewed daily, multiple times a day, any time that something comes in between what God wants you to be and what you ought to be. Or what you are. We ought to be what God wants us to be. Any time that something defiles what God has started or intends for our life, we ought to seek renewing. 
We ought to confess it so that He can cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. He says everything that God did was so that you could live every day in the hope of eternal life. That hope will drive you to do all them things that he started talking all or started this chapter talking about. Because you realize that the things that we see, the things that our flesh wrestles against, the things that we deal with day in and day out, they are temporary. They are fleeting. They're like a vapor. They're here one minute, gone the next. That's a part of carnal life. We have the hope of eternal life. Our eyes are set on things that cannot be touched by things here on this earth. Our hope is in something that's anchored within the veil. Cannot be moved. Right? Our life is dictated by something far more important than anything that we can see. Anything that we can feel. Anything that we can encounter. You stay ready when you're prepared to enter into eternity. You know why the Apostle Paul wrote that he fought a good fight, that he finished his course? Because every day he did his best to stay ready. Not ready to face what's coming today. He was ready to step off into eternity at every moment. At any time, God could call him home and he wanted to be ready to stand before God. If you're ready to stand before God with clear eyes, with an open heart, knowing that you've done all that you can do, you're ready to face anything that comes into your life that day. But too many of us are not ready. We don't have a hope of eternal life. We have a knowledge of eternal life, but we have not accepted it, embraced it, and we don't look forward to it. And because of that, we don't live every day like we're looking for something better. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.